Valentine's Day. How'd you find out? I have a little thing that goes ding on my phone, and sometimes I just I, I think about it, but I don't always mention it. But it's your day, so. Thirty-five years. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Happy anniversary and Valentine's Day. Thank you. It's kind of neat they schedule Valentine's just for your anniversary. Yeah, you can't forget <laughs> it. I'm wearing a rose. <laughs> I need some volunteers to read a couple of verses. I need someone to read Proverbs 3, 11, and 12. Who'll do that? Yes. And then I need someone for Hebrews 12, 5, and 6. Okay, Mrs. Dollins. I need someone for Yeah, Hebrews 12, 5, and 6. I need someone for Proverbs 3, 34. Okay, Frank, James 4, 6, Charlie. And uh, can you handle 1 Peter 5, 5 as well? Yeah. Okay. And then I need Proverbs 11, 31. Tajmin. Um, 1 Peter 4, 18. Mrs. Price. Um, Proverbs 25, 21 through 22. Daniel. Uh, Romans 12, 20. Proverbs 25, 21, and 22. Romans 12, 20. Lee. And then uh, two more. Proverbs 26, 11. Devin. 2 Peter 2, 22. Is your hand up? Uh, I guess it is now. Thank you. 2 <laughs> Peter 2, 22. 2 Peter 2, 22. Okay. Uh, let's just pray and ask the Lord to, to help us this evening. I want to... Uh, begin though by reading from Proverbs, and you don't need to turn there. I think you know this, but uh, I want to begin there this evening, Proverbs chapter 22 and uh, verse 6. Tramp a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. Let's pray. Father, help us tonight to arrive at a biblical scriptural conclusion that we could live out in our lives and that we could help others with. Lord, help us also to be believers who emphasize hope and truth. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, uh, who's my uh, Proverbs 3, 11, and 12? Be nice. Go ahead. The Bible says, My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father the son in whom he delighteth. Hebrews 12, 5 and 6. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Okay. Uh, okay, so that's a New Testament quote of the Old Testament. Uh, Proverbs 3.34. Surely he scorneth the scorners, but he giveth grace unto the lowly. James 4.6. But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. And then 1 Peter 5.5. 5. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one, um, one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. Okay. Proverbs 25. Uh, again, two quotes of an, of an Old Testament scripture in the New Testament. Uh, Proverbs 11.31 Behold, the righteous shall be recompensed in the earth, much more the wicked and the sinner. Okay, 1 Peter 4.18 And if righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly be in the sinner? Okay, New Testament quotation, the Old Testament. Proverbs Quote if you can't read it. Proverbs 25, 21, 22? Yeah. If thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. If he be thirsty, give him water to drink. For thou shalt eat cold fire upon his head, and the Lord shall reward thee. Yeah. Romans 12, 20. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt keep coals of fire. New Testament quotation of the old. Proverbs 26, 11. As a dog returneth to his vomit, so a fool returneth to his fall. 2 Peter 2, 22. But as it happened unto them according to a true proverb, the dog is returned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to their wall of the lion. Okay. 
Now, I want to just point out something here this evening because I want to help you with something. If you were to Google search um, a statement, our Proverbs promises, the first verse that would come up under every search would be Proverbs 22, 6, and you would find not one, not two, but literally thousands of articles written to explain that a proverb isn't really Scripture. The Bible says in 2 Peter 3.16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God as prophet, for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now you could argue today that the founders, you know, the, the, the church councils didn't have the right to determine the canonicity of the Scripture. And I wouldn't care if you argued that. It wouldn't bother me in the least bit because man doesn't determine Scripture. God does. And so, you know, a council or a senate meeting and, and, and a, determining the correct conclusion, coming to the correct, correct conclusion, doesn't make their conclusion correct. They don't make something to Scripture. They acknowledge that something is Scripture. And anyone can acknowledge truth. If I acknowledge truth, it's not my truth. I'm not the one that determined it to be true. God did. God gave the Scripture. God determines that the Scripture is the Word of God. The argument most individuals would make that train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it, is that Proverbs is an axiom, not a promise. Whereas the argument they make is, well, a proverb is a wise saying, but a wise saying isn't always true. But it's very interesting that we just quoted Scripture after Scripture after Scripture where the Word of God references the Word of God and doesn't reference it saying, well, you know what, sometimes it's true that a sow returns to its vomit, or a dog returns to its vomit, and a sow to its wallowing. It, it, it's sometimes true that, you know, that in so doing, if you, if you feed your, hung, your, your hungry enemy, and, or if you feed your enemy when he's hungry, and if you give him water to drink, you're going to heap coals of fire on his head. It doesn't say, well, sometimes that's true. It just simply quotes it as Scripture. In other words, I would say this, the men that the Holy Spirit of God used to pen Scripture acknowledged that the Word of God had full force, full authority as Scripture. A proverb is a wise saying that's helpful. Now, there are proverbs have principles behind them, don't they? You could take a proverb about a wise son and apply it to a wise daughter, and the principle would hold true for a wise daughter the same as a wise son. You could take a principle for a foolish son and apply it to a foolish daughter, and the principle would hold true. But here is, a, some, here is one of the alternative, um, alternative interpretations of Proverbs 22.6. Proverbs 22.6 says, this is the, the interpretation, this is not me. Proverbs 22.6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old he will not depart from it. In other words, by the time the guy gets old, he'll eventually return to the way that he should have gone. In other words, he's not going to remain in the way necessarily. He may get out of the way, but eventually he'll end up where he was started off at. And that's the interpretation of the proverb. Well, the problem, there's two problems with that. The first major problem with interpreting the Scripture going that direction, the first major problem is that it would be very hard for anybody to understand that by reading it. You know, in other words, why didn't God just say that if that's what He meant? You know, generally speaking, train up a child and when he's when he's elderly, then he'll come back to it. God could have said he'll come back to it, not he will not depart from it. Okay, so you wouldn't understand that. But the second major problem is that there's a first commandment which is with promise. What is that commandment? Love your parents. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long, and that thou, let's see, upon the earth that thou mayest live prosperous or whatever. I can't remember. It's It's... Three times it's, it's in the Scripture. Okay, so the assumption is, train up a child in the way he should know, he'll live long enough to return. Well, the fact of the matter is, that, that contradicts every other proverb that says fools don't live very long. And it also contradicts the promise of the Scripture that you won't live as long, your days won't be as long on the earth if you don't honor your father and your mother. See, if, if a mother and father raise their child a certain way and he departs from the way, he's dishonored his parents. I don't think there's any better way to dishonor your parents than to depart from the way you are raised. Is there? Honestly. Uh, and by the way, lost parents agree with that. Wicked parents agree. You know, you, you've departed. It's amazing how upset the wicked can be when their children choose righteousness. How, how it bothers them that they've departed from the way because they feel like you've dishonored us. You've left our religion, if you will, or you have left our atheism, or you've left whatever it is, and in so doing, you've dishonored me. And many of them would say, I no longer have a son, I no longer have a daughter, you know, because you have departed 
from the way in which I raised you. Uh, so would everybody understand the two, the two reasons that I gave why that just won't fly, why it doesn't work well? The first reason being is you, you wouldn't ever read the proverb and understand it, or if you read it, it would be too late to be any good. It wouldn't have any practical application by the time you read it. You know, well, you know, I have to wait until he's old to find out if he returns to the way he should go. It's not really a lot of hope when you're trying to raise a, you know, an infant or a toddler or a, uh, or a junior or a junior higher or a teenager. It's not a lot of help in it if you say, well, you know what, we'll see what turns around and comes back. So that's the first one. And the second reason obviously is that it, that interpretation clearly contradicts the scripture that you're going to live long and prosper. Whereas if a child departs from the way in which he should go and he's trained up right, then he's not going to live long. He's not going to live long. It's amazing how sin ages an individual. It's amazing. You say, Pastor, sometimes people you know, are very, very elderly and they've held to their wicked way. That's God's business. But you don't know what, how long they'd live if it were not for their wickedness. You don't know how they would, what their life would have been. You don't know what, how they would have prospered. Okay, so the argument that the Scripture cannot be always interpreted on the basis of its face value because it's only a proverb first flies in the face of the way the Scripture is treated within the Scripture. Do you understand the precedent there? If the Word of God quotes the Word of God as the Word of God, a proverb is more than a Chinese myth or a Chinese wise saying. You understand what I'm saying? Chinese have lots of proverbs, don't they? A lot of cultures have proverbs, but they're not inspired. Sometimes they're true, sometimes they're myths. Sometimes they're just based in superstition. But the Word of God is not mythical. And it is neither mythical nor is it uh, superstitious. It's actual. And friend, I want to say to you that the... I want, to, I want to just get down to the nuts and bolts and deal with it. And I'll answer questions if people would like to ask them uh, here in a few minutes. But I want us to understand very plainly from the Word of God that to levy an accusation against the Word of God that something the Bible says is cruel or harmful or mean and to interpret on the basis on that basis is not helpful. I've had many people uh, most are you, I'm telling you if you Google our Proverbs promises, all you have to Google is a statement like that is is a proverb a promise. The first thing that'll come back is Proverbs twenty two six and everybody will talk about how cruel it is for someone to have a child who's gone astray. And then for the parents to quote Proverbs 22, 6 to them and just basically beat them over the head with, well, you didn't raise them right. Now, is it nice to, to point out people's failures? You ever slip and mess up on something and everybody's got to point it out? It's amazing to me. You know one of the most frustrating things about trying to do remodeling around here? Is that people never see progress. They only see problems. I mean, you know how many people look at these windows and be like, is that, is that it? Are they going to look like that finally? You know, are they going to be? And they point out everything that's wrong about them. They're not done. They're not finished. You know, but I'll tell you what. There's a there's about uh, oh I don't know 24 hours of hard labor in them. That that whoever came in and said why aren't they painted yet didn't do. Uh, you can point out problems with anything, and it's it's really frustrating. You know, there's you just you can look at anything. Well, why isn't why isn't this? Why isn't that? You walk in a, in a room, and it's in our character. It's our nature to immediately not see the good, but to see the bad. And it is not helpful in the life of a person who is down and who is suffering for you to say, well, here's where you went wrong. You know, uh, at least not in car accidents anyway, right? You drive along, here's a car in the ditch. Well, you must have been driving like a maniac to hit the ditch like that. Just doesn't need to be said. Right? Does everybody understand that? In other words, coming along as a diagnostic technician for somebody who's failed in raising their parents and say, well, you know, obviously your kids are bad because you're a lousy parent is not exactly helpful, is it? In other words, the reason your child has a surly, rebellious attitude is because they learned it from you. Well, that's probably not the thing that needs to be said. But let me ask you a question. Might it be true? Most likely is, actually. Um, the reason your child has trouble with authority is because you don't like authority. You struggle with authority. 
Might that be true? Mm -hmm. Certainly could. Let me just help you with something this evening. Truth is the great virtue. You may not like for someone to say something that's true and maybe should doesn't need to be said, but truth is the great virtue. You know, I have pointed out Proverbs 22, 6 to people before when they say, I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened. You know, I, I was a perfect parent. And they go down the things that they did that were good in parenting their kids. What I've been saying lately is ask your children. The kids know what happened. It's pretty surprising. Usually if something goes along the lines of something like this, you had a higher standard for me than you had for yourself. It was okay for you to pop off and lose your temper and say whatever you wanted at work or say whatever you wanted about the past or about the authority, but I couldn't say anything about you. Oh, you had exacting standards for me to abide by, but you had no personal discipline yourself. It's amazing how many parents are absolute slobs in housekeeping, in uh, their personal matters, and yet they expect their kids to abide by a different standard. If you're going to be a slob, let your kid be slob. Let your kid be a slob. It's just be consistent about what you teach. I'm not preaching that theology this evening, but understand this. If you tell somebody to do something, you better abide by the same standard. You know, as a pastor, I find this true all the time. i found that if I don't participate in any event at the church, nobody else does. It's true. Uh, I'll be honest with you. Because I have two Wednesday, a Wednesday night service and a Thursday night service, and, and Melissa always does a Saturday night youth activity with Brother Taj, and because Sunday starts at 6 and ends at midnight for us, and because something gets scheduled every other night of the week, I would really like to have Monday and Tuesday night off, and I think it'd be reasonable. I just think being, I think for my wife and I, sometimes it goes, we go months without the two of us being home alone uh, in the evening. And sometimes I just think, you know, it would be kind of reasonable for me to get to go home at 5 o'clock and have dinner like everybody else. I never have 5 o'clock dinners. And I'm going to whine about it all night. Long. So <laughs> that's, that's part of being a pastor, right? One of the things I found out is if I don't show up on soul winning, you know, they may show up once, they may show up twice, but other people won't go. Why? Because they want to see pastor do what pastor expects them to do. And they're not concerned with whether or not pastor does it when they're not watching. They want to see pastor do what pastor expects them to do. It's amazing. But that's, that's a reality. It's like parenting. You know, parents, you, your kids better see you do what you expect them to do. You tell them don't talk back, you better not talk back. You tell them don't have a bad attitude, you better not have a bad attitude. Kids know what a bad attitude is just as well as you do. I'm telling you, a toddler can detect a bad attitude. A toddler uh, knows about selective hearing, do they not? A toddler knows how to not hear mom, not hear dad when they want to. And a toddler also knows mom and dad don't hear them when they don't want to. And my mom was last year taking care of my sister, and she's taking care of her little boy. And um, she, uh, she told Jacob, she said, she called for him, and he, and he was playing video games or something. And I, don't, I think that's what he was doing. He was doing something, and he didn't answer. And so when he came, she said, you answer me when I call you. Later on, um, he reversed that on her. Grandma, Grandma, Grandma. And my mom was hard of hearing. <laughs> and then he said, you answer me when I call you. <laughs> he told her, well, you know what? Maybe you oughtn't to say that to an authority, but maybe an authority ought to abide by the standard they hold you to. You see. Now, last Wednesday night, I, you know, all I can do is apologize. I had a, a guest here to, to preach, and I honestly didn't know his position on the Word of God and on, on child rearing. I, uh, when I scheduled the man with the girls' home to come, my assumption was that it was a girls' home to help wayward girls from any background, any circumstance. Uh, my assumption was not that they were girls who had been driven to rebellion by their parents and then basically locked down. Uh, as a result of that. And, uh, you know, when I watched the video Wednesday night, my thought was, I think we should lock up the parents 
or at least put them in a home with the kids and teach them how to parent their teenagers rather than um, send the kids away and punish them, put them on lockdown. And you talk about rebellious attitude, doesn't do this, doesn't do that, and I'm just looking at these people and I just sense the same attitude, the same spirit they said their kids had. The second thing that was missing in that video was the follow-up. You put the kids in lockdown, but you never followed up to see if it helped them any. Never see what happens. You're required, they, these girls are required to be in a program for 15 months. They're allowed one supervised visit every three months with their parent, with their kids, with their children. And that's beginning at the age of 12. And I think it's, it is um, beyond reasonable for any child to be locked up. At I mean, locked up. You study and you look at the program, they lock them up. And uh, that's, that's crazy. That's insane. I wasn't aware of that. What happened, uh, an evangelist friend of mine who is the, the right position about child rearing, didn't know the ins and outs and also didn't know all this, the, the corruption and the scandal that's happened with this particular group. And so they, they gave them my phone number. Said, yeah, call Pastor Price. He'd be interested in a girl's ministry. And so he called me and I said, well, I need to check into it. And this is about a year and a half ago. So I need to check into it, maybe schedule and you can get a come because I think there's kind of ministries that are needful, don't you? I think... I think there are girls that are struggling with, with sin, that are struggling with addictions, and, and, and not just teenagers, adult agers. That's the ones that we've really uh, found that really need help. The girls that primarily don't come from Christian homes or come from Christian homes that, are, that, are, that contradict what the Word of God teaches about parenting. And there are a lot of those. But um, there has been in a certain circle of fundamentalism a lot of a lot of holiness which is defined by action rather than by the heart's attitude in other words I'm not concerned with really what's inside I'm concerned with you conforming to my expectation for you on the exterior and I'm, I'm aware of it I've I have Fortunately, not been too intimately involved in it for lots of years. But I've seen it. I've seen it in church. I've been in churches um, where it's far more important that a man wears a suit coat and shaves than that he's saved. Uh, where it's far more important that a person conforms or complies with, you know, that a lady shows up in culottes or a skirt than that she's born again or that she has a meek and quiet spirit. It's amazing how many screaming homes there are women that scream but they dress submissively. Well, I don't, you know what? I'll just tell you something. That dress doesn't mean a thing if it's not in the heart. If the kindness and the love and the virtues of a Christian aren't there. And I'm very familiar with those circles and I've seen them. And unfortunately, I, I made the promise. I said, well, I'll look into schedule. I need to check in your ministry. He called me back at the appointed time. It was in the, it was, uh, in the summertime, and I think I was away at camp or something like that. He called me back. Hey, did you get a chance to decide? You know, check your calendar and, and uh, take a look at. Uh, I always have people send me material so I can look at their ministry. Did you get a chance? Well, I went him home. I hadn't looked at his material. I said no. So I went ahead and scheduled him. And then I found out afterward this is this is the mindset behind it. Now I want to look at the message that was preached on Wednesday night because it was unscriptural, and I want to just look at it. We'll go. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 18, if you would this evening. Ezekiel chapter 18. Ezekiel chapter 18, uh, and, and this would be in, in our, um, would have been in our series in the near future. And Ezekiel 18, Ezekiel deals with a saying that was an excuse for generational sin. In other words, it, it, it was saying, we are not responsible for our sin, our fathers are responsible for our sin. That's verse 2. Uh, what mean ye the use of this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, saith the Lord God, ye shall not have occasion any more to use this proverb in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine, as the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. In verses 5 through 9, we see a dissertation of a man that's just and does that which is lawful and right. In verse 10, we see... It, he, he, that he begets a son that's a robber, a shedder of blood, and that doeth the like to any of these things. In verse 14, we see that, that man who is a robber and a shedder of blood begetting a son that seeth all his father's sins which he hath done, and considereth and doeth not such like. 
And so we see three divergent generations. We see a father who is just, the Bible says, and he does, he, he's law-abiding. He does that which is lawful and right. We see a son who breaks the law. He's a robber. Now let me just ask you a question. Lawful. Robber. Are we talking about God's law or are we talking about man's law, by the way? Kind of both. I mean, God gives man given authority, or God, man's authority is God given. But when we're talking about lawful, we're not talking about keeping the Ten Commandments. We're talking about the guy doesn't steal. Do you get this? You understand the difference? The one obeys the law, the other one is a robber. And uh, he's a shedder of blood, he's a murderer. And uh, he does anything, uh, any of the things that are breaking the law. You don't have to be a genius to know that Ezekiel 18 isn't about parenting. In other words, if a parent comes to me and says, you know, my child's gone astray, they're not doing right, they're re rebellious, I don't say, well, who have you robbed? I suspect that the core of this issue is you're a thief. You stealing from your boss or did you rob the bank? What is it? You understand what I'm talking about? In other words, the scripture is not talking about parenting. Ezekiel 18 isn't about parenting. It's about individual accountability before God. In other words, you could say, My dad did this, and God said, I care about what you do. Or you could say, My dad did evil, and God said, I got him taken care of. What about you? And that's the contrast. In other words, what Ezekiel 18 is saying is break the excuse of the reason we worship idols is because our fathers did. The reason we don't care about the things of God is because that's what our fathers did. And he also is saying don't be bewildered because your children aren't exactly like you. They don't do it. In other words, your child can't say, well, my dad was a righteous man. How many wicked people do you know that had a praying mother and they think that's going to get them into heaven? Well, my mother, bless her heart, she prays for me every day. And she's just a saint. And uh, you know what? God knows about it. You know, you ask them if they're saved and they tell you about their mom. You know, you're kind of like, well, that's not residual. It doesn't trickle down salvation, does it? You answer to God for your sin as your mother will for hers. We're talking about behavior. We're talking about lawlessness. And we're talking about individual accountability. God says over and over three times in this passage, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Now, Wednesday night, the preacher went to, didn't really go to Genesis 18, but alluded to Genesis 18. And the allusion was to Abraham being a perfect father. Now, I don't know how many of you sat back and said, huh? But I did. 1 Peter, Galatians, Colossians, Ephesians, the pastoral epistles, all indicate what God's expectation of is for a husband and a wife and for children. In other words, what a good parent is. Let's examine and see whether or not God Himself said that Abraham was a great parent. Genesis chapter 18, verse 19. I'm looking at Joshua 18, 19. I always panic when the Bible doesn't say what it's supposed to. I'm like, whoa. You know, when, when, you, uh, when you can't remember things, your memory fails. There was something I couldn't remember um, earlier. I don't remember what it was right now, but there was something, and I just thought, man, I just don't remember. It had to do with time or something. I don't remember what it was. Just a little bit ago, I was telling you all something. I don't remember what it was. I forgot. <laughs> But when you have that, and then you look at the Bible and it doesn't say what it says, you're like, oh man, already? <laughs> I'm gone. <laughs> They're going to lock me up. <laughs> I've lost it. Genesis 18, verse 19. Let's read verse 16. The men rose up from thence, looked toward Sodom, and Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham the thing which I do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, 
and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him. And they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. Let's examine that for a second. We were told Wednesday night that God said about Abraham, I know him, that essentially he's a great parent. And he's going to do the right thing. What's interesting in this passage of Scripture, if you're going to go by what God said, it says, and the Lord, that they shall keep the way of the Lord. Do you see the second part of that? I know him that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord. If the first half is true, the second half is also true. We understand this? In other words, if God said, I know Abraham, he's a great parent. He's a perfect parent. And because he's a perfect parent, he's going to keep the way of the Lord. The question is, based on the Word of God, is that what the Scripture is saying? Is what the, what the Bible's teaching there? Well, then, Scripture is more suggestive of principles than even we're led to believe about Proverbs, if that's so. In other words, they turned out great. I mean, they hate God, and they rebel against God, and they hate God's people, but the fact of the matter is at this time, the Lord has just appeared to Abraham to make the promise of to make the promise that he's going to have his son Isaac born to him. So the first thing would be this would be retroactively. Now let me ask you a question. Is it possible to be right at one stage in life and wrong at another? Sure. Sure it is. You may be wrong today and you were right last week. Or you may have been wrong, and I'm talking about something's between you and the Lord, fellowship. You may have been out of fellowship last week and you're in fellowship this week. You know, uh, going in the way of your parents would certainly would certainly intimate that, wouldn't it? In other words, are there any perfect parents? Any parents that never make any mistakes? If their children continue in their way, how perfect will the children be? As perfect as the parents. Yeah, more or less. They, the soul of sin, if it shall die. In other words, based on God's judgment, a child's going to be more or less what the parents have raised them to be. Do you know that parenting is more than what you say? Can we agree on that this evening? Amen. Parenting is more than what you say. It is amazing how even the teenagers in our youth group imitate what I do far more than what I say. It's just, they do whatever I do, if it's good or if it's bad, if the people in our church imitate what I do and some of the things I say. It's amazing. It really is. When you're in leadership, people copy you. They do this. You hear some. I've heard before from people, I've heard things, and I'm like, well, that, sound, that doesn't sound nice. Where did they learn that? Uh-oh. <laughs> and I have to say, wow, I better, I better not say that that way anymore. I better not do that anymore. You know what? That isn't, that isn't, a, good, that isn't a good mannerism, or that isn't a good attitude. Why are they doing that? Uh-oh. And it comes back on me. That's one of the great things they say about being a church planter. If you have problems in the church, you, you know, you started it. You know, it's like, you, you, it's, it'd be nice sometimes to have a predecessor. Now, sometimes people have pastors before you, you know, that taught bad habits or whatever. You could kind of use that a little bit. But most of the time, if people got saved in this ministry, were baptized in this ministry, and were helped to grow in this ministry, and, they, and they've got a bad attitude or whatever, it's my fault. And sometimes it isn't because I taught it using words so much, but they picked it up. And sometimes it's because I didn't teach it, either with words or whatever. So we understand this evening that teaching is more than what you say. Yes. I think we can agree on that, can't we? Your kids pick up more than just what you say. Uh, I remember my dad making a very good do as I say, not as I do point, and it left an impression on me, but I don't think it was a good point. In the sense that, I remember one time him saying, I don't remember what we, we were discussing with him, but I think, I think Daniel and I were both having a discussion with him. I, it may have been just me. I remember saying, well, you, to whatever that he does, and he just flipped it back. He said, you want to be like me? I always thought my dad was pretty cool, but I didn't really want to be like that aspect of my dad. 
And it, you know what? You say, well, that's lousy teaching. That's lousy parenting. Well, I don't, I don't agree with the mindset behind it. But the fact of the matter is, at least he'd say, <laughs> at least he is real enough to say, hey, this isn't, you know, you don't want to be like this. And I remember thinking, that's a good point. And it helped me. It was actually a point that helped me. I'm not saying it helped every kid, but it made sense to me. Not only is parenting not just what you say, it's more than just what you say. In parenting, it's responsible to say everything that needs to be said. Training up a children means incessant involvement. Training children means incessant involvement. You don't finish by two. You don't finish by five. You don't finish by ten. Eleven, maybe. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? In other words, it's a little it's a little daunting, isn't it? To have a baby and think, you know what? At least until they're an adult, whenever that's individually determined. I don't usually go by the you know, the legal army status, you know, or the, the 18 or 21, it's kind of determined by how adult-like they are. And everybody's different, if you know what I mean. And you look at a baby and you just think, man, I'm going to have to stick with this until it's finished. It's a human, I know, but we're talking about the task. And that's a little daunting if you think about it, because the fact of the matter is nobody wants to raise a good child up till four and then blow it after that. Or till 12 and blow it after that. Or till 15 and blow it after that. I mean, that's an important, big task. It's a big job. And friend, I'll just tell you something. If you skip age 9, there will be some neglect in that child's life. I'm legitimately concerned about the youngsters running for president right now who have young children, Rubio and Cruz. I literally am concerned about those guys. I know this for certain, being president will preclude their having an involved father. It's just not going to happen at all, period. I think, you know, if I were a father and I had to make that determination, that would be a serious consideration for me. Am I willing to let my children be raised without a father? It's something they, they'll have to deal with, but it's a reality. I feel like writing them a letter and just tell them, hey, you know something, your children aren't going to have a father if you become president. I hope, you, hope it's worth it. You know, and uh, it's, a, it's a consideration. It's something I'm thinking about. The um, fact of the matter is you don't raise children by ignoring areas or missing areas. It's kind of scary. It's kind of frightening. <laughs> How did this happen? We never knew. That's a problem. You better know. I've heard it preached before and I agree with it. You better know what's going on with your kids. You better know what's happening. Well, we didn't know. You know what? My response to that is how could you have not known? You neglected your children. If your children get involved with something they shouldn't have been involved in, if they have a conversation they shouldn't have had, if they learned something they should not have learned, it's because they are put in a situation. You say, Pastor, you think you're going to raise your kids in a bubble? No, I think I'd just like to raise my kids where I'm there to comment on everything that they see. I've had people ask me before, Pastor, what about driving down I-95 and the billboards? Well, teach your kids about the billboards. Don't look at that, kids. When you see something that is, and you describe it, if it's nudity or if it's profanity or if it's something, look away. Avert your eyes. And here's why. Pretty soon it'll get burned into your mind. And once it gets burned into your mind, it'll be there forever. And you'll always have to deal with it. And it's a lot better to not have something in your mind than it is to have something in your mind that you always have to deal with. Teach your kids things like that. Um, I'm not setting standards for anyone in our church, but if I had children, sleepovers would be in the living room. And mom and dad would be in the living room. There wouldn't be these conversations where kids are left to themselves and things are left to do. You say, well, they're really good kids. Well, how do you know they're really good kids? I don't, I know, I've never met any of those. I think about being a teenager. My brother can tell you this. Most of the people that we were with, we all went to Christian school. We were pretty good kids. But when 
three or four or five or six of us would get together, we'd do things we'd never do. I mean, we literally would just do, I mean, I'm not talking about, you know, moral things. I'm talking about things. I'm just like, how, you know, who would do that? Me. When I'm with peers. It's like when kids get together, they're like, hey, y'all, check this out. One kid does something stupid. Another one's like, that's nothing. And the next thing, he does something stupid. And then everybody's topping the other one, and it just gets more and more out of control pretty soon. How do kids end up doing things like that? Well, they just get around the wrong people, start doing things, and their parents should have been there. I appreciated being a teenager a lot of Friday nights after basketball games. My mom would uh, let us have all our friends over to our house, and we'd play Monopoly, and she'd make cookies. And we had some really great times doing that. And I'll tell you something, we never harmed our consciences in those times either. Because my mom's right there in the, in the kitchen with us. And parents, you know, it's kind of a pain to make co cookies and hang out with teenagers, because nobody likes teenagers. But the fact of the matter is, I'm just joking about that. But the fact of the matter is, is that involvement, hey, listen, it's a daunting task. You have kids, you have to raise them. It's, it's kind of a serious matter. That's why I've, you know, you say, Pastor, why? Well, that's why. It's just too big of a job. I'm joking about that. The Lord hasn't given us children. But I'll tell you, if God gives me children, it's going to be a big job. And it's a daunting one. It's a frightening one. And it's one to take very seriously. Here's what a lot of parents think is the formula to good parenting. Take your kids to church, enroll them in youth group, and put them in a Christian school. And when I see parents that say, well, I had them in a Christian school, and they learned all that stuff at the Christian school, my thought is, you thought the Christian school would raise your children. And you're wrong. It's not their job. Well, I put them in the youth group, and that kid in the youth group they met, they ended up getting together, and da-da-da. And my thought is, you thought their youth group would raise your children instead of you. And it's not the youth group's job to raise your children. Well, I took them to church every single Sunday. My thought on that is, <laughs> you evidently contradicted everything you learned at church. You know, listen, Christian, I'm telling you, to raise children is not a, I did this, this, and this, and this, and then we stamp you and say, boom, good parent. Let's send your kid off to boot camp. It's their fault. I'm not a parent, but I have never lost an argument with a kid. You hear me? I'm not a parent, but I've never lost an argument with a kid. I've never had a kid put me in my place when he's wrong about something. I haven't had a kid storm off. Listen, when I, when I was I uh, worked in Delray, we'd have you know at that time we'd have as many as 120 kids a week, and I was the guy that talked to the kids that got in trouble. I was the one that had to deal with them and determine how to get them to do right. And we were trying to kick them out or trying to get them to do right. And I remember a counselor dragging in a kid kicking and screaming. And when the counselor had the kid kicking and screaming, they were like rolling their eyes like, what are you going to do with this? And I said, sit down. And the kid sat down. What would you have done if the kid hadn't sat down? Well, wouldn't have made a good video. Just kidding about that. <laughs> you know, the fact of the matter is is that it, it just incenses me. The, you, know, you see this about a month or two ago, this girl, 11 year old girl in a classroom whose teacher whose teacher told her she was acting up in classroom, so her teacher told her to leave the classroom and go to the principal's office, and she wouldn't leave, so the teacher went and got the principal. The principal came, couldn't get her to leave, and so they went and got the school security officer, and she wouldn't get out for the security officer, so they dumped her out of her chair, and they said, it isn't what she did, it's how they, it isn't, it isn't that they, uh, that they, you know, it doesn't, who cares what she did, it's how they treated her. And that, and that school enforcement officer got fired for dropping her out of her chair. She wouldn't get out for the teacher. She wouldn't get out for the principal. And I promise you she wouldn't have got out for her parents because that's where she learned it to be defiant like that. And then her parents said, it isn't, you know what, you just don't, I don't care what she did. Nobody should treat a child like that. I'm sorry, but that is, well, I don't have words to describe what that is, but it isn't logic, it isn't good sense, and it isn't going to help anything anywhere. I'm just telling you some 11 year old is not going to tell a good parent how it's going to be. A 13 year old isn't, a 15 year old isn't. And you don't have to lock them up somewhere to, to be able to reason with them. Do you know that husbands, have you, have you figured out there are some times that just aren't good to have a conversation with your wives? 
Wives, have you figured out there are certain times that it's just not the best time to have a conversation with your husbands? Did you know that your kids are the same way? When they're emotional, when they're unreasonable, when things aren't well, send them out and come back and deal with it. You say, well, you need to deal with it right now. You've got to break their will. You've got to whatever. Well, that's that other kind of theology, that other kind of thinking. You've got to beat them, into, beat them into behavior that's submissive. No, friend, you sit your child down. You talk about what it is. You talk about what, what God's Word says it is. You talk about how, the, the harm and the danger in it. If there's no harm and there's no danger in it, then you've got nothing to talk about. You're wrong. They're not wrong. Because you're making an argument about something and you don't have an argument for it. What are you arguing about? You understand? If you don't have a position... And you're arguing with your children, you're only provoking your child. You're only proving that you're the boss. If you're the boss, you don't have to prove that. You understand that? And so you explain to your kids, kids, this is why, mom and dad, this is why you can't. This is why you always have to. And you explain it to your kids, and guess what? You tell them about the love of Christ. And you don't put them on a guilt trip every time where you, you know, you don't lead your child to the Lord when they're being disciplined. You know, I just need to get saved right now. I mean, that's a really good out. You know, that's not the time. But you need to teach your kids the truth, to teach them why. You know, here's why you can't be lazy. This is what will happen to you if you are. This is why you can't. This is what will happen. Just train your children. Just train them like you would an animal. I mean, we're nicer to animals than we are kids, honestly. I don't train them like some people train animals, but train them like, you know, people that are good with animals train animals. Right? Or just train them. Training is verbal, but it's also physical. And the physical is not the submissive aspect. The physical of it is the follow my lead aspect. If a kid has a bad manner or mannerism, talk to him about it. And then set standards. And then uphold the standards. And when you set standards, agree on it. Do you think this is right? Do you think this is reasonable? It's fine to do that. You know you can reason with children because they have brains? They don't have brains, and you, yeah, you may have to institutionalize them. But if they have brains, you can reason with them. And I say all that because that's what's missing. That's what's missing in parents that say, we did all the right things and our kids turned out terrible. It's amazing. I, I've, I've watched homes that are very permissive with parents that really love the Lord, and they, and they, and they manage to teach their kids to love the Lord. But I'm talking about just kind of manners and discipline and things like that. They're just kind of missing. And I've watched kids turn out, all of them turn out pretty good in homes like that. Just nice kids. They love the Lord and whatever. You know, they, they, mom and dad let them do things that, you know, this mom and dad won't let them do. I watch homes that are very, very strict, very, very ordered, and have a lot of, you know, this home over here would say, wow, that's pretty, you know, that's a lot of rules there, a lot of whatever. And I've watched the kids raised. And they learn to love the Lord and they grow up and they live for the Lord. And I've noticed between the two that the kids don't always mimic their parents with regard to how many standards or rules there are in a home, but they imitate that love of God from their heart. You, you think you're going to raise your children to dress a certain way or you're going to raise your children to uh, look a certain way or you know, you're, you're, you're ignoring individuality. God makes kids individual, and it's because He has individual callings for them. He has an individual purpose. And you try to take away individuality from a child, that's just nonsense. There are some parents that try to culture individuality to a point of extremism, and I think that's nonsensical as well. What I'm trying to say is this. It's the, it's the heart of the kid that's important. You've got to win the heart of a kid. If you ever get to a point where the child absolutely defies you, that's a two-way street. And I'll never believe otherwise. When, boy, I can't even talk to them. They make me so mad. And they can't talk to you because you make them so mad. That's two ways. It's a two-way street. And you've provoked your child. And so I don't agree that Proverbs 22.6 should be ripped out of the Bible. And I don't agree that Abraham was a wonderful father, the man that had his wife pretend not to be his wife in Egypt and had her do it again with Abimelech and the man that uh, allowed his wife's notion of having a son according to the flesh instead of leaving the promise of the father and had an illegitimate child with his wife's servant as a great father. I don't agree that uh, the way he raised his children after 
was a great way to raise his children. There were a lot of things in Isaac's life. He, he taught some favoritism and special treatment that Isaac picked up on because of the way he should go. That He loved Esau more than he loved Jacob, and Jacob's mom loved Jacob more than Esau. If you try to tell me those two men are models for parenting, I say to you, the Bible has a lot more to say about parenting in places where it talks about parenting. I'll just tell you, the children of Israel had. The, it took me a long time understanding the scripture. Two things, uh, two things growing up that nobody ever gave me a good answer for. I just had a hard time with. One was polygamy. Polygamy. It just was tough for me. And then it occurred to me. I had a. I had a lightning bolt uh, moment when Jesus defined marriage. He said it was not so from the beginning. God said. For this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother, and they twain, they two shall be one flesh. And then you read the law, and you see that uh, when Israel came, or when, when God was giving the law to Israel, He told them, don't you have a king that marries multitudes of wives? Everybody's like, well, David had a lot of wives, and he was a man after God's own heart. And he broke God's law doing it. And subsequently, how many good children did David raise? Kind of Solomon? How many good children did Solomon raise? Big fat zero. And every child in that line of Davidic kings was a son of a robber that turned out to forsake the way of his father, so to speak. In other words, he broke from the way of his father. Christian, practically speaking, you and I need to understand this. We're individually responsible. And as a parent, we need to espouse the individual responsibility as well. That's one of the reasons that you just you can't take Ezekiel 18 and make it a passage on parenting. It's not about parenting. You can't take God and accuse Him of saying that <laughs> Ishmael's a perfect son because that isn't what the Scripture's teaching. But you can go to the Word of God and you can look at what the Scripture does teach it. Let's just look at a couple of those things. I think you know them. I think you know what we teach here. I think you know them. One of them is Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a child in the way he should go. When he's old, he'll not depart from it. You train your child, he'll turn out like you train him to, to turn him out. Let's go to the pastoral epistles. We're out of time. It's a long message for this evening. I wouldn't have preached this message, but I don't want to confuse our people. And I feel, I'll be honest with you, I'll be truthful with you, I've been bothered all week about it. It just bothers me because I try to be careful about who we put in this pulpit. I don't, I don't put any perfect men in this pulpit. I don't put guys who don't preach the truth. But, but uh, that was error that was preached, and it was all error that I couldn't find any truth. I just, I found Ezekiel 18 to be a wonderful passage, and then praying over preaching in a couple of weeks on Sunday morning, I thought I was excited about it, but uh, I just saw it butchered. You know, the Word of God just taken out of context and misused and abused. But there are some scriptures that, that's pretty specific about behavior. First Timothy chapter 3, Paul told Timothy, he said, This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desire the good work. A bishop must then, then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. Verse 4, one that ruleth well his own house having his children in subjection with all gravity. You say, Pastor, but that isn't for the layperson. That's for, that's for a bishop. That's for a pastor, leader of a church. He's supposed to have good kids. Now, let me ask you a question. If you want to take that position about parenting, and by the way, those kids on those videos, those were pastor's kids. And those pastors should have been out of the ministry trying to win their kids. you got to lock your kid up because they're in rebellion. You don't have your children in subjection with all gravity. Subjection with all gravity isn't a straitjacket. But those individuals take this passage of Scripture and they just ignore and go to the Old Testament and, and corrupt the Scripture. So you want to say, well, pastor, they're talking about lay people. We're not talking about a pastor. Those are standards for a pastor. You know, no, my friend. No, no, no. No, God, God isn't better to preachers than He is to lay people. Do you understand that? Right. You know, a pastor isn't a, isn't a special calling. And God doesn't hold a pastor to a standard that you can't possibly be held to. And God isn't worse to pastors than He is to lay people. He doesn't hold them to a standard that no one else can be held to. 
Understand that? Which to take that assumption, what you're saying is, well, pastors can raise perfect kids because they're pastors. But lay people can't. And God doesn't have that expectation. That's nonsense. I believe this. I don't believe that every man in the church ought to aspire to be a deacon, but every man ought to aspire to be qualified to be a deacon. Would you agree with that? I think every man in the church ought to aspire to be qualified to meet the biblical qualifications for being a deacon. Verse, verse 12, Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children in their own houses well. For they that have used the office of the deacon well, purchased to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Deacons are held to the same standard. As a pastor is. And the standard is, if you're going to be a pastor, this is a qualification. If you don't meet this qualification, you're not qualified to be a pastor. That's the standard. I think that it's pretty apparent what God's opinion about child rearing is. In other words, if a man can't raise good kids, there's something wrong in his home. And if there's something wrong in his home, there's something wrong with him. Good leadership always, always, always says, where did I go wrong? It's lousy leadership that, that throws its... throws your, You throw your staff under the bus, you're a lousy leader. Throw your employees under the bus, you're a lousy leader. Who did that? A, a good leader never says that. A good leader always says, you know what? How did I cause that? Sometimes I was too permissive with that person, and maybe I allowed that person to be on my staff too long. I've got to eliminate that. But I have to, I'm the one that has to deal with it. What they did... I should have led differently so they wouldn't do it. That's what a good leader always does. A good leader always, always, always takes the responsibility. Any of the elite forces has more casualties in leadership in the higher ranks than they do in the lower ranks. That's one of the things I've always admired about the Israeli Defense Force. The Israeli Defense Force has more officers injured. I don't think it's a great idea to you know, have your leadership put out where they can get killed easily. But their officers, they have more fatalities and more casualties among their officers than they have among the troops because leadership says, if we're going to be fearless, or if we're going to expect our troops to be fearless, we better be fearless ourselves. In other words, I can't say go. You'd be more afraid of me than you are of them. They'll just go join them and come back and get me. What I have to say is, let's get them. Let's go. We're not afraid of them. And that's the way a parent needs to be. A parent needs to say, well, you know what, if it's going to be hard work for a kid, you know it's hard being raised right? It is. It's hard work. It's hard work to make good grades. School's hard work. I was so thankful when I got done with school and then I bought in for college. I was so thankful to be done with college and I went to seminary. I always said, man, I've hated school my whole life. I've never liked school. I, I've, liked, I, I've known the necessity of learning and I, I deliberately learn a lot. But friend, I've never liked school. Never enjoyed. I remember being in kindergarten and people saying, You like school? And my mom going, Oh, you love school. And I'm thinking, Yeah, I love school. <laughs> I better, you know. But I never liked school. It's hard work being a kid. It's not always easy. And you know it's hard work being a parent, too. It's not always easy. And it's really helpful when a child's wrong for the child to learn to say, I was wrong. It's really helpful for a parent when they're wrong to say, I was wrong. You'd be amazed how the both love covers a multitude of sins, but you'd be amazed at how honesty and humility cover a multitude of sins. Some of the, the people that I think are the best parents in the world will tell you, man, I've, had to, I've just had to go to my kids and confess being wrong. I've just, I, I've, I, I tell you, some of the best parents I know will tell me, I just feel like the worst parent in the world. But I am determined that Proverbs 22, 6 is a promise for me. I'm going to train my child. You know, you don't have to be the best at something to get the job done, do you? You don't need to compare yourself with somebody else. You know what? You could have driven to church tonight in a Ford or a Chevy or a Toyota or a Dodge or a Honda. One of them might be better, but everybody got here. And whatever you're equipped with, and I'm talking about your intellect and your capabilities and your background and so forth, let me just say to you, you all have the same Word of God, and anybody can take what they have and train a child. Now let me deal with the statement that I made right at the beginning as we conclude. One of the things that's oftentimes said is that Proverbs 22, 6 is used to beat parents whose children have rebelled over the head and hurt them. You know what Proverbs 22, 6 needs to be used for? 
Proverbs 22, 6 needs to be used to build parents to have an expectation that even though they're not perfect, if they do what God says, they can expect for God to bless the result. And that's a wonderful promise. And I'll finish as well by saying this. If I didn't believe that promise, I would encourage no one to have children. If I thought I could have a child and he'd burn in hell for eternity because whatever I did to raise him would make no difference, I wouldn't have children. And I'd tell parents, don't have children. Do whatever it takes not to have children. I thought that just it's just up to you know, evil, cruel fate or Calvinism. God's going to select some to be evil and some to be good, and voila. Some go to heaven, some go to hell. Wouldn't have kids, and I'd encourage everybody not to. But you know what I do? I see parents that love the Lord and live for the Lord. I say, have as many kids as you want. Let's, let's make a difference in the world. Because if you're a good parent, you will make a difference. You'll raise godly seed. I look at families that have third, fourth, fifth, sixth generations. Something they have in common is that they believe Proverbs 22.6. I look at families that have kids that rebel in the first generation. And something they have in common is they don't believe Proverbs 22.6. Think on that. The Bible says about false teaching, by their fruits you shall know them. I'd rather have good fruit, good kids, than bad fruit, bad kids. Father, thank you for what you taught us this evening. I pray that you'd help it to sink in our minds and our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And Luke said, You're dismissed. You're dismissed. <laughs>